way to be without fear Is in the now, I'm learning how Fast life, no thanks, no I'm doing just fine Thank you so much for your time, I'm so excited You're welcome So first of all, how are you? Are you I'm fine, thank you, I'm fine, excellent, thank you very much Are you busy, even in, in retirement life? Yes, I'm not really, I'm retired from a, from a job, but I'm not retired from my passion. Which is? A passion cannot get retired. That's right, that's right. So what is your passion, right, these days? <laughs> <laughs> my passion has been the same for the last 50 years. It's uh, about watches. Mm -hmm. I have a passion for watches. I'm a watch collector, I'm a watch producer, I'm a watch fan. So that's so, my passion. And my passion was my job. That's right. Then how does it manifest itself into, into your life these days? I mean, uh, it, it, it goes into my life in full harmony. My life is split between passion and love. Mm -hmm. and that's is, what it should be. <laughs> the best. Yes, it should be, right? But unfortunately, not the case for many. And, uh, no, that's unfortunate, I must say. That is a That's why I'm very privileged. Yes, yes. And I am privileged to be talking to you right now and then, and then picking your brain a little bit. So maybe we can inspire those who haven't found that yet, that balance. And maybe hopefully, you know, they'll get some insight. So I'll just go, go straight into it and then maybe, maybe we can just... Yes, you know. please, yes. How do you stay relevant these days in the sea of sameness? You just have to remember... Uh, a few thousand years ago, Confucius wrote already that only the dead fish swims in the, in the speed and in the direction of the current. A fish that is alive, he swims left or right of the current or against the current. And if he swims with the current, he goes twice the speed. So dead fish means you just follow the current of the river. That was what Confucius wrote to us, among other, uh, other uh, declarations. So it was already the fact, it was already the truth many, many years ago. And so uh, today is not different from yesterday. You must always try to be first, different, unique. You must try to be first, different, unique. And if you are first, different, unique, then you will be different, you will be different, you will be first, you will be unique. And uh, that's my philosophy, because I wrote Confucius in 1967. And in 1967, I got the message from Confucius and I said in my life, I will never be like others. I will always try to be first, different and unique. And I don't want to be a dead fish. I don't want to swim in the river like a dead fish. I want to be alive. And so <laughs> nothing has changed because if, if Confucius could tell us this many, many years ago, it, may, it means it was already like this today. And today is not different. It's right. just that every, every generation discovers more or less the same things. Philosophically. I could not agree with you, but some people are afraid to be unique, to stand out. Of course, out. Because, because people are not educated uh, in order to get uh, um, courage. People are afraid to be different. People are afraid to be wrong. People are afraid of the failures. And that's a, a problem of education. If you educate your kids uh, that a failure is necessary to conquer success, that success can only be reached by a certain number of errors or failures or mistakes, that every mistake brings you further to the success, and that every failure should be forgiven, <laughs> uh, then 
you educate your kids in the total other ambiance and the kids might be uh, uh, how do you say uh, might be uh, ready uh, to be entrepreneur because to be entrepreneur means you have to invent you have to be um, different you have to innovate you must have the courage to be wrong you must be able to accept that you are wrong you must be able to share your mistakes you must be able to doubt you should not be afraid of your doubt the doubt is is here to help you so all this will make the difference. So the difference comes from the education and education in school, education in the religion, education in the parents and education in the social life. So it's the whole education system that uh, brings certain kids to success or to not be afraid while others, which is the majority, unfortunately, will be afraid of being different. I know your kids are very successful and, and they, you always listen to them because they were always on, on top of, of the news. But how did you instill that in them at home as they were growing up? By, by respecting them, by listening to them, uh, by not destroying their hopes or uh, by forgiving them their mistakes, by encouraging them to be different, uh, by congratulating them sometimes for the mistake, because certain mistakes are necessary in life. And many mistakes you should do them when you are young, because the older you get, the less mistakes you should do. <laughs> because a mistake when you are 25, you might have 60 years to correct and to uh, recover. If you do mistakes when you are 70, you don't have many years left to come over the mistake. So I always said to my kids, you have to do mistakes now, as many as possible, because later the mistakes will have another weight. And now it's lightweight. <laughs> Whatever mistake you do <clears throat> has not a lot of consequences. And, uh, but uh, you will learn a lot. And there is no learning without mistakes. But there's also no learning without listening. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to listen and, uh, and you need um, uh, uh, to have courage. Courage and listening uh, is essential. Many people don't want to listen anymore. Many young people coming from big universities, they are, have a lot of convictions, but they have no doubts. Mm -hmm. And if you have only convictions, how can you learn? The doubt helps you to learn. The doubt helps you to become uh, humble. The doubt helps you to double check. Uh, the doubt helps you to listen. The doubt helps you to learn, to change your mind. And that, uh, uh, all this should be uh, transmitted to kids to the education system and uh, of the parents in a very light and smooth and a way with a lot of love, but that's what you have to, to teach them. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about this new way of parenting, which is to always praise them, even if they just for anything and just never, you know, um, give them challenges. Um, you know, loving is great, but then when you also always tell your kids you're the best, the best, the best, they, they don't learn to fail, right? So what is your opinion about this new way? No, love is not to say to your kids, everything is good, what they do. Love doesn't mean you should pay them a lot of pride. And uh, uh, no, love means you should educate them. Love means you should, um, you should help them uh, to... Um, get wise in life. Um, love is not saying yes to everything. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's more difficult to say no than yes. And you should never uh, be weak 
and say yes because you are weak. You should be strong. And being strong means I say no now. It's enough. So kids, they need a very strict way and they need consistency. You cannot change the what you tell them today and then probably tomorrow you are weaker and you do it differently. Kids need a constant uh, and always in the same direction. That's right. Shakespeare but you know, kids, the best way to educate kids is to be in harmony with yourself. And then the second best is to be in harmony with your couple, with the parents. Mm -hmm. And then the third way is to be in harmony with your, with your social environment. And the fourth way is to be in harmony with your job. And if you live in harmony, you can transmit harmony. That's right. What is your opinion about taking risks? And what age is it okay to take risk or should someone stop because they're getting older? Because I heard you in a, in a podcast recently where when you were younger, you know, as a young person, like you said earlier, you have your whole life, you have nothing to lose, right? So you can take as many and you should take as many risks and fall as many times and get back up as many times as possible. But you, would you say that at some point one should stop taking risks? Oh, never. <laughs> you, uh, the older you, you get, the wiser you might be. But being wise doesn't mean you may make no mistakes. You just make other mistakes or you make mistakes with very small consequences. It's important in the mistake theory, how much, what's the consequences of a mistake? Consequences can be very minor or consequences can be heavy. And so it's important that the older you get, the more mistakes you should do, but the smaller, the, the consequences should be. be. I, I, that's not for me, that's from Einstein. You know, Einstein said on the question of a journalist, what do you wish, Mr. Einstein, for the, your last years of life? He was something like 80 in Switzerland when he got this interview. And Einstein said, I wish for the few years that I'm still here living a life I wish to do more mistakes than ever. And the journalist said, wow, what do you mean? More mistakes than ever? He said, yes, because the more mistakes I do, the more it means I am active. But I want that each mistake I do now has very small minor consequences because that means that I am wise because my mistakes have nearly no, no consequences. So you see, if I do more mistakes, means I'm extremely active. And if every mistake has very small consequences, means I'm wise. How have you in your life overcome fear? And what has been your mental discipline and routine um, I'm sure maybe change as you got more successful and wiser, but in, in general, what is your routine and your... My routine is trust. I trust myself. I trust life because I'm optimistic, because I'm positive. So I trust life. I trust nature. I trust me. I trust myself. I trust human beings. It doesn't mean I trust everybody. But I have, as a basic behavior, trust. Mm -hmm. And if you have trust, it doesn't mean I'm not afraid of certain things. Uh, but my major uh, attitude is I trust myself. I trust God. I trust nature. I, I, and that helps you to, be, to stay positive. And important is stay positive. If you have a positive thinking, positivity might happen. If you have a negative thinking, never will you get a positive result. So stay positive. 
trust you. Trust your destiny. Trust your, uh, 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 your, your activity. Trust your entrepreneurship. Trust your friends. Trust your family. Trust God. So trust is an important element to avoid that fear takes over to you. But I, I had fears. I still have fear. Probably if, I, if somebody would tell me now I'm going to die in 15 minutes, I might have fear for the last 15 minutes. Who knows? So, but nevertheless, in my, in my normal life, I am guided by trust. And trust is for me the best way to to get to get away from fear. Were you always this way? No, no, I'm better now, and I will be better in ten years. So <laughs> I improve. Thank you, God. So because you have nature and nurture, right? Some people are born more destined to be happy, genetically speaking, and some have to work on it. So well, you did something that you had to work on that doesn't come as naturally or? Of course, I, have, I had to work on me. I have to work on my, my, my philosophy, my, my behavior, my, my destiny. I had, I, I'm not passive. I have always tried to say I'm responsible of what is happening to me. Mm. And as I'm responsible of my life, I am the boss of my life. And if my life doesn't go in the right direction, it's because of me. It's not because of somebody else. It's so easy to say, ah, oh, I have not been successful because of this or that. No, you are responsible because you are in charge of you. And you are the boss of you. And you make the destiny of you. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, that, that's, that was my thinking. But that's also a very, very um, heavy thinking because it, it means it puts a lot of pressure on you. Mm -hmm. The pressure is on you. If you say, oh, it's not my fault, it's the destiny, it was my boss, it was this, then you get, you take the pressure of yourself away and you put it on somebody else, but that's not the solution. <laughs> that's true. I always say stop being the victim and start being the victor. Yes. And, 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 and take responsibility. Also, when you take responsibility for your part in things going wrong, you actually empower yourself because you have more control over what you do and think than other, over other people, right? So if you're always a victim of other people, then you never have power because you cannot change others. So when you take responsibility, then I think you can take, you know, make decisions to change and then that you become empowered in, in, in that sense. So what if someone has a great idea, but doesn't have the knowledge or the right resources um, to make it happen? What, what should they do? I mean, the, the idea is as important as the execution. So if you are happy with ideas and you sell ideas or you promote ideas, that's good. But if you are entrepreneur, you must execute. And the execution is 50% is of the value of the idea. It means uh, without execution, a value, uh, uh, an idea is just a theory. Mm -hmm. So transforming a theory into a reality, <laughs> that's a big challenge. And therefore, I would never recommend to somebody to go into an execution of an idea in a field that the person doesn't know. Because who are you to try to execute an idea in an environment that is strange and that is new for you? That's impossible. Which means the idea must be must come together with experience. And if you have the experience of an environment, if I have an experience in watchmaking and I have an idea in watchmaking 
eventually I can execute the idea. But if I have an idea for a vaccine and I have no, I don't know what means epidemiology and I, I, have no, I don't know anything about uh, 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 chemistry, and, uh, then my idea might just be a wonderful page of theory. So uh, it's important never forget the execution. And the execution if, <laughs> is half of the success of the idea. So I'll challenge you a little bit on this. How about your cheese? Because you were not uh, by trade a cheesemaker, right? When you decided to, to make this really expensive, amazing cheese. So you had an That's, idea. I had an idea, but you know, I never executed the idea because I never made cheese myself. I had an idea of cheese and I took uh, uh, the, one of the best young cheese makers of Switzerland and I gave him the mandate to develop a cheese with my ideas, which were the ideas of the 17th century, and he made it. I could never have made it. So my idea could never have been executed if I wouldn't have had the idea to take one of the best cheese maker and he was able to translate my wishes, my dreams into reality. So there are two parts. If, 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 I would have be, if I would have had to make cheese myself, it would have been the biggest failure because I have no idea. Now, after 15 years, I know a little bit, but I'm still, I am nobody who I am, who am I? in order to say, I know something about cheese. No. And this is also a rule. If you want to employ people, employ only better people than yourself. Because if you employ people that are less good than you, how can they help you? So every time you recruit people, try to recruit people that, that are better than you in their field and then they can help. But many people are afraid to hire better people than themselves mm -hmm. because they are afraid of strong and <laughs> of strong people. If you're threatened. So my, my, I said, I want to do cheese, but if I want to achieve it, I need one of the best cheese maker and I'm gonna take him as a, as a partner and I will, uh, employ him, uh, all his knowledge, and that's what I did. So at the end, I should be more specific and say it's not my cheese, it's our cheese. It's a combination of one of my ideas and of the execution of the cheese maker. So either you have to know exactly what you're doing when you have an idea to execute, or you need to surround yourself by people who know that specific thing. So you have those two choices. Okay. So when you were working at the, you know, at the office, who were the ones who stood out to you and what, like, like the underdog? Would, would you pay attention to everybody? And then if someone stood out to you, what did they do to stand out, first of all? And, uh, and when, what did you do when you noticed them? I always recruited people around myself that were better than me in their field. And uh, that's why I have the same crew the same team since 1986. You know, the, 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 the person that has been with me the longest, the, she joined me in 1979. Wow. And the youngest person joined me as my employee in 1993. So I have people between 79 and 1993 who joined me, certain in 79, others in, seven, in uh, 82, others in 86, others in 89, and then the youngest in 1992. And this team has been with me in every adventure, in every business. I took always the same people. Wow. They, they passed from one brand and they went to the other one. I never moved alone. When I moved to a new, a new brand or when I took over a new brand, 
the brand was new, but the people that were coming with me to restructure the new brand, these people were with me for many years. And so now I have people that have been with me more than 40 years. <laughs> and that's a very strong team. That is. You're these really people loyal. have made my success. So what are and they? I have made their success. Too. That's right. Well, so what do they do now as you are retired? You still have projects, obviously. Yes. Yeah, so, some, some of them have become CEO. The new, the Ricardo is now the CEO of, uh, of Hublot. Uh, others have been a consultant. Uh, they have uh, changed their position and now they're consultants. Others have all opened their own business. So all these people, which are younger than me, they, they, uh, they, another one became the CEO of Rolex. So they all found after me a fantastic position. And that's my biggest uh, success is the number of people I had. And I, how can I say? I, do, I drove them, I, I, I motivated them, I, 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 I taught them, I was their mentor. And when I see how, where they are now, I say, wow, I was successful uh, by having people that I was able to bring up. Mm -hmm. And my biggest success is more people than business. And that's, that's the beauty of my, of my job. But I can be, more, I can be very proud about the numbers of people that I have helped, that I have brought to high responsibilities, then money, money is okay, but it's more important to have been able to build up a lot of people than to build up a lot of dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, I always Ideally, it's good to have both. Yeah, uh, yeah, because we live in a material world. But I always tell my clients and myself is when you're on your deathbed, no one will talk about how much, how many cars you have, but they will tell you, they will say how you made them feel. So that people will always remember. So I think that is the biggest legacy that anyone could ever leave is how they made other, other people feel. So that is a, a, a testament to you and congratulations on that. Do you think someone can get a mentor at any age or is it at some point it's like you're too old to now get a mentor? <laughs> at any age, you need a mentor. Why? Because at any age, you need to learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the older you get, the more you should learn. Because if you learn, you cannot be old. You only get old when you stop learning. <laughs> the learning process is... The, uh, uh, it's, to be young, what does it mean? It means I, I am young, I learn. The baby, when he's born, the first thing he does, he learns. He learns to see where is his mother? How can he get the food of his mother? How can he get love from his mother? Uh, the learning process, is the most important process in life. As soon as you stop learning, you are like dead. Only the dead people don't learn anymore. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the older you get, the more you should listen, the more you should look around yourself, the more you should learn. And as long as you learn, you are connected to the future. If you don't learn, you get connected to the souvenir, to the past. And sometimes you see old people and they talk about yesterday. And when they talk about yesterday, it's like they are already dead. You should talk about tomorrow because we cannot live in yesterday. We can only live in tomorrow. So the learning process is the most important element in your life. And never should you stop learning. Only once you are dead, you can rest. All the, as long as you are alive, you must learn. You must listen. You must look. And the worst that can happen is that you stop learning. What is your advice for people that are 50 and plus? 
who really who don't want to stop stop living, especially I mean in a world that's sort of very ageist world, uh, especially in Switzerland. As soon as you have reached a certain age, all of a sudden it seems like doors are you know not opening as as easily. So, what is your advice to people in general, people employing older people or people who are older who want to still be relevant? What is your advice? We, we should always we should value uh, experience. And somebody that is, I say anything now, 60 or 70, uh, he has a value. The value is that he's old. Being old has a lot of disadvantages from the body, from the, uh, from the strength, but that's, all, that's only physical. And the physical weakness is not relevant, except if you are an athlete, that's this. So uh, 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 we must be conscious that people with experience means people with asset. The experience is an asset. And therefore, we should never lose experience. And in a company, if you fire all the people that are older than 60 or 70, you lose a lot of experience that disappears. So, you, but you cannot conquer the future without the experience of the past. No tradition, no future. <laughs> you, you cannot. So it means we must learn, like in Asia or in Japan, that all people should be respected and all people should be cheered because of their knowledge. And we should take all the knowledge from all people in order that this knowledge doesn't disappear once they die. So that is something we have to learn from the Japanese mentality, where the older you get, the more respect the society pays you, the more, uh, the more uh, you, you have value once you get older. In many countries around Europe, old means bad, old means past, old means retirement. Okay, physically, yes but not here and not in your heart. As we live in a challenging world right now, where do, one word of maybe, you know, a positive note on people who, are, who have become a little bit bitter or tired of what the situation, where do you think it's going? What is, what is the opportunity behind this, this you know, pandemic. What is the that? What is the upside of it that people should focus on rather than the downside of it? You know, in a crisis, there are always opportunities. A crisis is a mixture of threat and opportunity. Of course, in the crisis, the percentage of threat is probably eighty or ninety percent, but you have ten or twenty percent which are opportunities, and once one should concentrate on those 10 or 20 percent which are the opportunities that the Christ brings with you but most of the people are concentrating on the 80 percent of the Christ which are the thread which is the uh, um, and and you see it in the newspapers you see it in the political uh, the um, uh, in the political um, speeches, yeah. we always put 80%, it's ah, the pandemic is like this, and then there is a variant coming from South Africa, which is more dangerous, blah, 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 blah. Nobody tries to concentrate on the 10 or 20% that the crisis has positive elements. And the crisis must somehow become your friend and not your enemy. If the Christ is your enemy, you have lost already. You cannot win against the Christ. You can only take some opportunities in the Christ. Opportunities, for instance, some of your competitors <laughs> are having difficulties or some other uh, CEOs uh, are in panic and they sell shops or they reduce costs. And then you see this and you say, hey, we have an opportunity here. Let's try to take advantage 
of the panic of others. Let's take advantage that everybody is afraid. Let's take advantage that they want to save money. Let's spend now. And they, so we must concentrate on the 10 or 20% positivity that are in the Christ. I agree 80% of the Christ is negative, but 10%, maybe maximum 20% is positive. And go for this 10%. What do you think some of the positives are? Many positives. Uh, alone that people are afraid to spend money, people are afraid to travel, people uh, want to save money, people want to shop, uh, to close some shops, people are reducing or are hiring, uh, uh, um, uh, putting people, or, or, uh, how do you say? Um, so there are many, many, many uh, ways in each industry where you can find uh, uh, positivity. Losing jobs is a positivity. No, but yes, it's a positivity because you can suddenly you can hire somebody that you never would have hired because nobody, he, they would never have put him out of, of a job uh, as long as the turnover was good. Now, because of the difficulty, an idiot is saying, let's, let's get rid of this guy. He costs too much money, mm -hmm. but he's the best. So hire him. Mm -hmm. So hiring in the, in, the, in the Christ is something very positive. That's right. Thank you again so Hello, much. Thank you. Thank you. Have an awesome day. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. The way to be without fear is in the now. I'm learning how. Fast life, no thanks, no I'm doing just fine.